Welcome to Seeking Alpha CEO Interviews. Quality of leadership is a decisive factor in stock performance, so we provide in-depth interviews with the best and brightest CEOs in the public markets. We publish limited excerpts from our interviews on social media platforms and the full interviews at SeekingAlpha.com and in the highly rated Seeking Alpha mobile app. To find the full interviews, open SeekingAlpha.com or the Seeking Alpha mobile app and search for the phrase CEO interviews or simply type a stock ticker into the search box. My guest today is Jack Lynch, the CEO of Houghton Mifflin. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, several things, including the recent uh, sale of the trade uh, and media uh, business uh, by Hot and Mufflin to uh, News uh, News Corp. Jack, let's uh, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, why why the sale? Yeah, uh, great being here with you, uh, with you Josh. Uh, the sale uh, actually makes a lot of sense for us because. We have a leading market position in a very large market, a $10 billion instructional materials market, uh, which is a subset of what we spend on K-12 education, about $740 billion a year. And uh, it represents, our K-12 uh, business represented 85% of our overall revenue mix. So we're really looking at a relatively small portion of our revenue mix that was not focused on education, focused on trade publishing. And uh, we knew that it was kind of a mid-tier player in a consolidating industry in trade publishing. And uh, we also knew that um, uh, we could use the proceeds uh, to pay down debt and really improve our capital structure. But the biggest reason is really a singular focus on K-12 where we have a great opportunity or doing very well and really want to double down on being successful in K-12. Gotcha. Remind us, what were the, uh, the proceeds from the sale and what might you uh, use them for? Yeah, we uh, sold the business for $349 million. Uh, and uh, we'll be using a little over 330 million of that, uh, of those proceeds to pay down debt uh, and really improve our capital structure. And since uh, we announced the sale, we've already had uh, a upgrade from Moody's and our credit rating to B3. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, a target uh, leverage ratio of uh, just under two times. Uh, so it's a real significant improvement in our capital structure. Gotcha. I, as you know, I, I know you said as part of that, you might look at some uh, potentially tuck in acquisitions. What areas might you look at uh, for potential uh, tuck ins? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing to say about that is that we're really pleased with our portfolio in our organic growth and the growth we're experiencing right now. Uh, first quarter, we reported 11% top line growth and feel really great about um, the portfolio as is. However, we think we can accelerate growth through uh, tuck-in acquisitions and have more inorganic growth that is complementary to the existing portfolio. So I'll give you an example of the types of tuck-in acquisitions we'll be looking at. Uh, two years ago, uh, we acquired an early stage company called Waggle, which, was a, which is an AI-based uh, uh, practice uh, solution for reading and for math in grades K through eight. And um, we invested a good bit after the acquisition in that business. And essentially what we're going to do is plug it into our platform, but also put it in the bag of, you know, the industry's largest sales organization. So it, the net effect of it is almost like a robo harpooning a whale. Uh, it, that very small early stage company was able to leverage our customer footprint, our uh, large sales organization, the industry's largest sales organization but also being integrated into a platform with other complementary uh, programs. And as a result of that, uh, Waggle is now growing at triple digits and is a material contributor to our annual recurring revenue. And as you know, Josh, we 
you know, finished the first quarter with 80% growth in ARR and more and more of our business every day is moving to subscription. And that particular acquisition uh, is a, a great contributor to uh, the growth in our subscription business. Understood, understood. Get, getting back to the, the main business, what, uh, what we were talking before, we talked a little bit about competition um, and doesn't seem like there's too much on the public front or, or private for that matter, but who do you see as your, your, your top competitors out there and how has the, the landscape changed? Yeah, it's a great question. If you look at that $10 billion in a total addressable market, uh, we have about 10% of it. And interestingly, 10% is the largest share in that market, which suggests uh, that uh, it is a highly fragmented market. Uh, and when you look at our competition, there are, there are scores of point solutions that focus in a particular area uh, that have a puzzle piece of a comprehensive solution, or maybe two puzzle pieces of a comprehensive solution. So what really sets us apart from our competition is a comprehensive solution that's made up of not only what we call grade level content for kids who are on grade level, but intervention solutions for kids who are below grade level, intensive intervention solutions for kids who are significantly below, as well as uh, programs that help kids who are uh, you know, operating above grade level and need to be challenged as well as professional learning solutions, as well as computer adaptive assessment solutions. And so while we'll, we have competitors in each of those swim lanes, if you will, there isn't another company such as HMH that has a comprehensive solution. And so that's the way we think about our, our uh, competitive environment is not only competing uh, with the point solutions with gr really great solutions, but when you integrate, integrate them in a platform as a connected solution, a teacher can address the needs of all the kids in his or her class across an achievement spectrum. Uh, and as we move to digital, and the pandemic was really a forcing function for teachers to move to digital, you're going to see more and more preference shown for uh, a platform that really connects these various point solutions in one solution. Gotcha. You know, when we talked before, one of the things, you, you did say there was a competitor, now the name is escaping me, but it's going to have an IPO soon. And uh, I just wondered if you thought that might be a chance for you guys to get sort of more attention as far as, because you know, sometimes you see these IPOs and uh, it gives more attention to the, the, the companies that are already out there. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're, there are very few companies in the K-12 market that are public companies. Uh, part of that is just uh, the fragmentation of the industry. Uh, but a part of it is now you're seeing more and more attention, investor attention to the education industry and ed tech in particular. We're the largest learning technology company. And because we're focused on technology, we're now getting more and more attention than we ever had before. And one of the reasons why our stock is up 200% year to day, uh, more than 200% year to day, is we're getting more and more investor attention uh, because of, of folks who are willing to invest in understanding the market dynamics, but also in invest in understanding the fundamental growth fundamentals of this business. So we feel we're, in a, we're poised to intercept significant growth in the market. Uh, that 90% of the market we don't have uh, is, is a great headroom for growth. And uh, we're now getting more and more investor attention that frankly we had not gotten nor had any of the other public companies in the market, the market uh, gotten uh, up till recently. Um, one, you know, you mentioned the pandemic, but I just wanted to go into that a little bit further. You know, what learnings did, did you get from the pandemic? Um, is the, you know, the upside you got from the pandemic, is that, do you see that continuing? Obviously, there probably was maybe a little bit of extra, I would, I would assume, but, uh, you know, talk about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, really good question. Uh, and in fact, I was with 
a few educators last week uh, to ask them the very same question. Uh, what did you learn that you're gonna apply post pandemic? Um, and, uh, and what are you gonna return to? And I think what we're seeing is in the pandemic, we did pull the future forward. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, the, the device to, uh, excuse me, the student to device ratio was about two to one. Uh, that was a limiting factor to the use of technology in a classroom. Now we're pretty close to one to one because when all those kids went home with, and about 12 million of them didn't have access to a device, much less the internet. Uh, school districts really focused on infrastructure over, over the last uh, 14 months during the pandemic. So now uh, we're gonna be able to move more aggressively in K-12 education to the use of technology for teachers who can uh, automate their workflow, can use technology to measure more precisely student progress, and then also use technology to personalize instruction. But the one thing that we know that uh, we had, which we kind of lost uh, during the 14 months of the pandemic, is uh, the need for uh, uh, social emotional learning, the need for that social gathering in the classroom. And as a result of not having it, we had pretty significant dislocation and learning loss. Uh, McKinsey did a study that will show that six months at least of learning what we call interrupted learning uh, as a result of the pandemic. So going back this fall uh, to a classroom will really be the intersection of the first time for the first time between the social gathering where kids learn from other kids, they learn from their teacher and whole class discussion, they learn with projects, they learn being in proximity with one another. But that classroom will now be infused with technology to help personalize learning and advance the learning of each and every student, regardless of where they are on that achievement spectrum. So it will be different. We won't be snapping back to the past. We'll be really applying a lot of lessons learned to the future. I tend to recently, I mean, for a while, have written a lot about, this. Just, just thought about this, about some of these Chinese, I guess they call them AFT companies, after school tutoring, uh, TAL education, and uh, New Oriental. Is that yeah. something that you see? I don't, forgive me, because I don't know. Is that something that you see uh, coming to the US at all? Is that something that you guys think about at all? Not they coming, but you yeah, may, maybe you guys starting it or other companies. Where? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think, been a good uh, market for tutoring in the United States for some time now. Tal is a great example of online tutoring. I think more and more tutoring will uh, be online in the future. We tend not to focus on the home market uh, because companies that really focus on the institutional market tend not to do well in the home market and vice versa. Mm. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I think you will see more and more, uh, you know, demand for tutoring solutions that are delivered uh, digitally to the home market. Uh, but yeah, our focus is really outfitting educators with the tools and resources they need to improve student achievement. Right, right. Uh, just from you know, from uh, seeking alpha investor perspective, what metrics uh, and or catalysts should you know the uh, the holders of uh, of you guys of, of Hot Myth and look for you know and say the next six months, what 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 should we look for? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is uh, earlier this year. Uh, we provided guidance uh, for our billings of uh, 905 million to 955 million. Uh, so uh, look at our guidance, look at our performance over the course of the year. Uh, we feel really good about the guidance. Um, also look at uh, uh, the unlevered free cash flow guidance uh, we provided of nine to 11 percent on those billings. And then finally, and this is a new uh, a new. Uh, metric for investors, but one that we think is really important to understand the intrinsic value of this company and the growth potential of this company. And that's our annual recurring revenue, which is essentially our SaaS business, if you will. Uh, and uh, whereas that was about 5% of our revenue mix last year, 
uh, we're guiding to 10 to 15 percent this year. So if those are the those are the three things uh, I think investors ought to be looking at in terms of our performance over the course of this year. Gotcha. And the the 10 percent you know of the market that you guys have, where you know say I don't know next three to five years, where do you hope to get that to? Uh, what what percent of the market do you think you guys could could achieve? Yeah, I mean, we haven't uh, we haven't guided uh, or disclosed a number, but obviously we're looking at a number north of ten uh, percent uh, as a result of leveraging our platform, leveraging our presence in schools uh, to really optimize same store sales. Uh, uh, our country allocates about two hundred dollars per year to each student for instructional materials. Uh, so when you think about our share, that's about $20 per student. And we think there's a lot of headroom for growth just growing that share. Gotcha. And you guys are, are solely uh, focused on the U.S. Any plans to, to get outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, we're actually in 150 countries. Oh. Uh, I, I however, <laughs> the, the way to think about us is predominantly U.S., uh, where we operate in another country, it's usually supporting an international school or an American school or a British school or a Department of Defense school. Uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in China and in Asia, we do some English language learning in China, so that's a part of our business as well. But relatively small portion of our revenue mix is uh, uh, non-domestic. Gotcha. I guess last question, is there just, you know, Free for you. Is there anything that you think uh, investors don't understand about uh, Alton Mifflin that you want them to know? And uh, you know what? 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 Anything in particular you you really wanted to uh, to emphasize? Yeah, I think the key thing uh, that I have to do at a cocktail party when folks know Houghton Mifflin uh, that's usually as a student or a parent, and they think of a textbook. Uh, and uh, the thing that I would like people to really uh, understand uh, more fully is that we are a technology innovator in this market, using artificial intelligence to personalize learning, uh, using a digital platform that showed 179% growth over the last, uh, over the last trailing 12 months. Uh, it is a business that is incredibly innovative, and it's not the business that you remember being a student or a parent of children uh, once upon a time when it, there was a math textbook. So understand uh, the innovative potential of this business, and I think you're well on your way to understanding the intrinsic value of this business. Jack, appreciate the time. This has been Josh Feynman with Houghton Mifflin CEO Jack Lynch. Uh, again, thanks for, for the time, Jack. Thank you, Josh. Really appreciate it.